evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Rachel Narwald. For those of you that haven't met me, I am the nurse practitioner with the Preventive Cardiology team, and we are thrilled to have you here tonight joining us for our uh, March edition of the Building Bridges to the Community Lecture Series, where this evening we will be discussing beyond diabetes. So please know that we are recording this, and if anyone misses it tonight or afterwards you've loved it so much, you want to share it with all your friends, we will be putting it on our YouTube channel, which is called Doc Heart Health, and we will list this out for you as well. But I wanted to let you know if there's anyone that you wanted to be able to join this evening and wasn't able to, this will definitely be available in the future. So I'm just going to briefly introduce everyone to our illustrious panel. And this is a very interactive talk. So please put any of your questions in the Q&A box, and I will be fielding those as we go along. I will do my absolute best to answer anyone's questions. But of course, you can always feel free to email us afterwards if there's anything we don't get to. So don't worry, we will answer all questions as we are able. So I will start with introducing Dr. Preswala. Thank you so much for joining us. She is a attending physician and assistant professor in the Division of Endocrinology uh, as part of the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra. She's also the course director for the Endocrine Grand Rounds. So we are thrilled to have her here tonight. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. And then Dr. Hirsch we have, who is also an assistant professor of medicine, and that is part of the Division of Kidney Disease and Hypertension. So we are thrilled to have him here tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Hirsch. Thank you. And thank you. And we have our wonderful patient advocate, Agnes Chukluski. She is a champion of community outreach, but specifically, she is our diabetes patient advocate for the evening. And she is a women heart champion who is affiliated with Lenox Hill Hospital. So she does some amazing, amazing work in the community. Thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you very much. Yes, and I'm sure most of you know Dr. Gianos. She is also Associate Professor of Cardiology. She's our System Director for Cardiovascular Prevention, and she is the Northwell Health Director for Women's Heart Health at Lenox Hill Hospital. So Dr. Gianos, if you just want to give a quick overview as to why we chose this topic tonight, why we think it's so important, especially related to cardiovascular health as well. Absolutely. Our mission tonight is just to get a mes message out to the public about how important this topic is. Uh, all of us on the call, I think, have started to rethink diabetes in the past couple of years and um, see that we have new approaches and more therapies out there. So we want everyone to have that information. But more importantly, in the past several years, despite the fact that we had originally seen a major decline in two decades of heart disease um, in our country, just recently, we've actually seen an increase in cardiovascular disease. And we really think it's largely due to increases in obesity, diabetes, prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, <clears throat> a lot of conditions that fortunately we can treat and we can prevent um, heart disease. So we wanna make sure people are aware of the conditions that what prediabetes is, what diabetes is, and um, what these conditions are so that they can start to recognize them early and get help from where they need it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, without further ado, I'm going to start out. I'd love to pose a question to you, Dr. Preswala. Uh, I think we all know that some of our patients really have varying levels of comfort when it comes to daily glucose checks. So I'd love to have you give us some tips and your opinion as far as finger sticks daily for patients versus uh, continuous glucose monitoring. Yes, so that's a very sensitive topic to many patients, primarily because a lot of the patients with diabetes also have neuropathy, and so they feel hesitant in checking their finger sticks frequently. Uh, there's another group of patients that don't like the sight of blood. So that's another reason why they don't check finger sticks uh, daily as well. And I think it's important to first ask the, the patient what, what the reason is that is uh, the barrier to checking finger sticks, whether it's lack of supplies or the sight of blood or uh, whether it's a uh, you know, lack of motivation or are they just uncomfortable always seeing high numbers or, and they just don't wanna keep checking. So I think that 
question poses a, a really good, a, a valuable tool for us physicians to find out. And then uh, based on um, their answer and based on their barrier, I usually address, um, and based on their diabetes control, I address whether or not it is necessary to check finger sticks once a day, twice a day, three times a day, or four times a day based on their diabetes uh, control. And it's important to check finger sticks in a variable manner where they're checking sometimes in the morning, sometimes during the day, sometimes after a meal, two hours after a meal, or sometimes before a meal to kind of get an idea of what their sh sugar control is, what their glucose control is throughout the day, uh, not just in the morning because many people end up checking just in the morning and that does not give you a good uh, representation of their diabetes control. So it helps to have var uh, variable glucose numbers. Um, and uh, in terms of, um, com in comparison uh, for that with uh, continuous glucose monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring just provides a lot more information during the day as well as during the night. Uh, depending on the sensor, there is requirement to calibrate for accuracy in comparison with a, a finger stick check and make sure that the sensor is providing accurate data. There are numerous different types of sensors on the market. Some, um, most of them actually provide alarms and notify the patient if they have a low sugar uh, or if they're having a high sugar. And so that way it's more uh, helpful versus a finger stick check because uh, otherwise the patient wouldn't know if they're having a low sugar um, or a, high, a really high reading. So the continuous glucose monitoring definitely helps the patient to be more in control of their diabetes, providing them that information, that tool. Uh, there could be more than 1,000 readings in one day as opposed to getting a maximum of four or even six finger stick checks. So that's a huge difference in uh, having patients get the knowledge of their glucose values as well as providers in addressing their diabetes regimen, whether it's oral medication or insulin changes. Absolutely, thank you so much. That, that was Can such I a great answer. Can I just ask a question about, from a patient point of view, um, for someone who is non-insulin dependent, um, what do they do with all those readings? I can, I can tell you for myself, I'm old school. Um, I do my finger pricks, but um, if I'm getting a thousand readings during the day and I'm on a set routine of pills, what do we do with all the readings? Yes, that's a great point. So actually patients who are not on insulin may not be qualified for a continuous glucose monitor. So it really depends whether they're paying out of pocket or they have really good insurance that is approving, that is providing them the continuous glucose monitor in the first place. From a physician standpoint, um, usually a continuous glucose monitor is not indicated for somebody with uh, just medication, oral medication, because there is no need for that much information. It's uh, equitable use of resources is not you know, perfect in this condition, um, in this situation, I should say. And so it's probably easier, convenient, as well as better for the patient to do less finger sticks than ha have a continuous glucose monitor if they're on oral medications. They may get away with one uh, finger stick reading if they're in good control, or maybe even three finger stick readings a day if they're not in good control on oral medications to provide that information to the physician. That's Thank excellent. you. Thank you. And I'd love to move it over to Dr. Hirsch. Uh, the comment about the anxiety that's produced from the glucose checks really made me think about how our patients can feel often about checking their blood pressure. And so I, I would love to hear what you think, Dr. Hirsch. I think that in general, sometimes patients are pretty comfortable uh, with some of the maybe more obvious things. So as far as their glucose numbers, their A1C, things like that, but maybe not so much with other labs that we would monitor as, as providers and what they can do to help stabilize those numbers, not only with, with medication regimen, but also with lifestyle habits. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you, you mentioned blood pressure to start. So I'll just briefly talk about that. Um, you know, I obviously I deal, manage a lot of blood pressure and work with patients uh, frequently to manage their blood pressure and get it to target. And particularly um, people who have uh, diabetes often have high blood pressure as well. And um, trying to manage both at the same time can often be very challenging. Um, I often try to focus on one at a time. I think, you know, it can be very overwhelming when people come and they have newly diagnosed diabetes, newly diagnosed high blood pressure, and no one knows where to start. And I think it's very important to, to kind of take, you know, take one step at a time. 
because when we're thinking about these diseases, we're really playing the long game here. You know, unless the blood pressure is wildly out of control or the diabetes is wildly out of control, we're doing things today so that in five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road, um, people are still healthy and living happily, high quality lives. And that's really the goal. Um, and so I, so one of the things is to always make sure that we, that we, that we meet people where they're at and making sure that we really focus um, on, you know, without, without overwhelming um, on one, one piece at a time. Um, and it's, 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 it's very collaborative, right? It's, you know, a personal amongst the physicians, but, you know, as, as a team working with the patient at the center, um, that we're all working together um, and, and really kind of, you know, uh, in, a, in a team effort and, and, a, and in a relationship. This is a relationship. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, kind of, it's a long-term relationship. It's not, you know, and so, um, you know, I always tell people when I see them for the first time, I say, I'm going to see you again in a couple of weeks or in a month and, and I'll see you again after that and after that. And we'll, we're going to get through this. We're going to figure this out. And, and that's, in, it's, we're working together on that. Um, and so for blood pressure, management. Um, everyone is very different. We really have to customize, you know, kind of what the best, the best way to kind of manage uh, and monitor people's blood pressure. You know, some, for some people, um, monitoring it just in the office is, is all they want to do or all they can do. That's all, you know, that's where they're at. Um, for some people, they want to have very tight control of their blood pressure. They want to monitor and track those numbers. Um, and for some people, um, we I have to I have to basically tell them to put their blood pressure monitor away because the anxiety that it's causing is just too much. I mean, my grandfather was what that person. He would call me up at three o'clock in the morning and say, "My blood pressure is one sixty, and I would say, "Put it away, and go to sleep." Um, so you know, we have you know, so it's it's very variable in how it, 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 and every everyone's different. Um, but in terms of you know, to your other question, Rachel about. Um, other things to think about in monitoring for people who have diabetes, um, and this goes along with blood pressure problems as well. Um, you know, on the kidney front, we we you know we um, we think it's very important that we monitor people's kidney function um, because we know that you know the the main causes of kidney disease and the biggest risks for kidney disease progression are diabetes and blood pressure, um, being overweight or obese. Um, those all of those factors can add extra strain and stress on the kidneys over time, and monitoring. Um, people's, you know, people have to, you know, monitor their kidney function, um, and that's through urine and blood tests, um, and, and on a semi-regular basis, and how frequently that has to be done is dependent on, you know, their uh, overall health and, the you know, their overall stability of their medical conditions and as well as their kidney disease. Excellent. Thank you so much. I love what you said about the relationship and that collaborative, how important that is. Agnes, I'd love to have you weigh in uh, specifically as far as I know you had some challenges when you first started out. It's very important to find a provider and it's very important to have the education around the disease process. So I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit about that. It, it, to me, that made all the difference of whether or not I felt like I was in control of my life or not. Because when I first found out I was diabetic, um, I was amazed. I mean, I started out with readings in the 400s. And to go to a doctor and have them ask, do you want pills or do you want the needle? And, and that was the guidance I was given. So needless to say, I changed doctors very quickly um, and, and found an excellent diabetic education program that taught me what I should know, how I should know it, what I should do. And for the first three years, I guess, I was not on any pills. I was controlled by exercise, weight loss, and just my own knowing how to manage my diet. Um, in the 20 years since, obviously, my needs have changed, medications have changed, but it's still good to go back and I find myself needing to learn. As I read something, I see a commercial on TV about some drug, you know, related to diabetes, I have to go look it up and read for myself because it's only then... Um, that you're really going to get a sense of what's out there. And then the other thing, um, definitely, is you have to be an advocate for yourself. If I was to have taken that original doctor's recommendation, and I don't know what I would have done in terms of controlling what I do with my own body. And to be an advocate with the doctor, you need to have a doctor that you relate to. 
And not only do you relate to that doctor, but you feel comfortable enough to talk honestly with the person. And, and it's that honesty that sometimes really, you know, because people are very good at saying, oh, yes, I'm eating a perfect diet. I am checking five times a day. I am so good and holy. But at the same time, is that really what they're feeling? There's a certain amount of diabetic burnout for patients who are testing perhaps too often and not knowing what to do with the results or not feeling they can control it. And there's also a lot to do with the diet that people eat. People think, oh, I can never have sugar again. Well, that's as far from the truth as can be. In that case, you can never have sugar, you can never have fats, you can never have carbs, but everything plays together. And that's what you need to work with your doctor. Absolutely. And, you know, Dr. Janos, I'd love to move to you. Uh, I think, Agnes, what you said about the constantly changing guidelines and recommendations is so, so important. Trust me, it's challenging for providers. Forget about, you know, patients trying to stay on top of that. So, Dr. Janos, specifically, as far as your medication recommend uh, recommendations with some of the newer therapies and their benefits with heart disease, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Sure. I, I first want to start by saying, you know, that uh, Agnes brings up so many important part, uh, points, which is why she's uh, worked with us on our Women's Heart Program and also as a diabetic uh, advocate, obviously. Uh, it's pretty clear. But, um, you know, advocating for yourself is very key um, and understanding the disease process, I think, is very important and knowing what to expect when you take a medication, knowing what to expect when you eat a certain food or exercise. Um, so the one important point is, lifestyle. And it does relate to guidelines because the guidelines all recommend, no matter which society's guidelines you look at, they're going to tell you that the first thing you do is you work on diet and exercise. Even if you're giving medicines, you still work on those things. So that's a really, really uh, key point. And, you know, it is working on diet is definitely somewhat of a spectrum and you're always shifting in the good direction. It does not have to be perfect, but you know, the more that you can change, the better you will do um, is the reality. Um, and then beyond that, you know, I would say that as cardiologists and potentially I would, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, swear by this, but I would assume nephrologists too. I mean, we stayed out of diabetes management. I was like, this is not my area. I will not be managing any of this in my practice <laughs> um, until, you know, a couple of years ago when things changed and a lot of the med new medications that came out appeared to have benefits in reducing heart attack, stroke, heart failure, kidney disease, causing weight loss, having beneficial effects where, interestingly enough, the prior medications uh, that were used, although they lowered sugar and some very effectively lowered sugar, they didn't actually reduce heart attack or stroke, at least in the studies that were done and stuff. So it just was a whole new paradigm uh, a few years back. And all of a sudden we realized, oh, wait a minute, if these things reduce heart attack and stroke and you know, maybe we need to start prescribing them and learning more. So, um, so you know, essentially I think that the, the medication classes that we'll probably talk a little bit about, um, one is metformin is still a very good drug and part of all the guidelines uh, still, it's just a question of, do you go for that first? Do you go for that with something else? Do you go for something else first? And it's gotta be individualized, I think, uh, to the patient, um, but it's a very effective medication safe on a whole if it's for the right patient. Um, it is affordable. It's been out for a while so patients can get it. Um, so there's definitely a lot of good benefits. Uh, the other two classes are uh, lots of initials, SGLT2 inhibitors, and then GLP1 agonists, so two different classes. And we'll probably get into you know discussing about each of them a little bit. Um, and I think the people on the call can certainly uh, speak to one or the other, depending on what, you know, the benefits obviously in their fields, but um, you know, the SGLT2 inhibitors are the ones, and again, there's a lot of trade names you'll hear them on TV, um, but the way they work is they reduce, they get rid of sugar sort of in the kidneys and you sort of uh, filter out sugar. And with that sort of a little bit of sodium and water follows, but you're able to, through a completely different mechanism than any of the other drugs had worked on before, get rid of sugar further. But there's a lot of other benefits um, that seem to have other effects in the body where they seem to uh, improve your uh, heart pumping function and 
they lead to weight loss through loss of water and, and different um, aspects. They do obviously lower your sugar um, to some extent. Um, they improve your kidney function. So that would be the first class. I think we can start um, just to sort of understand that that's one class. And then I, I suppose you can ask the others about um, their thoughts. You know, maybe we just start with the class on the SLT2s and Rachel, whatever questions, you know, you have on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did have a, a sort of more specific question where let's say we started a patient on an SGLT2 inhibitor and their kidney function was at a certain level when we started it. Now, we know these drugs are very, very protective of the kidneys, very, very beneficial. However, we may have patients that have some decline in that kidney function over the years. So if somebody is having that decline, there are varying levels of GFR guidelines, if you will, for the various SGLT2 inhibitors. So I'd love to know in your expert opinions if do we need to think about switching patients to different SGLT2 inhibitors as the GFR may change as kidney function may decline or is that only a, really a consideration when we're initiating the drug? So uh, maybe I'll, I'll take that one to start. Um, so I think this is this is a very interesting and really exciting area because um, we're really literally in the midst of Learning new information um, each month, and, and you know, and and you know, and the where you know, how to how to dose these and for who it's appropriate is constantly changing. In the last two years, we've seen a complete shift in in in, in you know who can get it, which patients it's safe for, um, and I think it's it's really exciting because we we're kind of we're continuing to broaden um, the safety profile of these drugs. Um, and so I think that's that, that is for a second. We have a yeah. lot of people who are not medically based in here on the call. If you could just like give us some of the common names of the drugs that people might relate to so that we know for sure what we're talking about. Sure. So the um the so the trade the, the trade names are Invocana, Farsiga, and Guardians. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So uh empaglifosin, depaglifosin and uh, okay. Canag 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 <laughs> so there is it's, it's a mouthful. <laughs> if they end in flozen, that's the medicine that you're talking about. Again, yeah. on the on the commercials, you're gonna hear those trade names that uh, Dr. Hurst just mentioned. So yes, yeah, very important to understand what medicines we're talking about. Exactly. And we also have Stiglatro, which is our Tugliflozin. Right. And there are other flozins coming out. Yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna keep keep right. <laughs> every day. <laughs> But in uh, to, in terms of the the impact on you know on on the kidney function and in terms of safety profile, um, so first first off the the primary thing that we think about you know as I mentioned kind of briefly earlier the two variables that are particularly important in monitoring kidney health um, one is called uh, G it's it's a it's a, a abbreviation GFR which stands for glomerular filtration rate so we'll just go with GFR. Um, and the GFR basically more or less tells you how well are your, is the filter function of your kidney working. If you think of your kidneys as doing a lot of functions, but primarily cleaning the blood and maintaining the right balance of everything inside your body, how well do your kidneys do that? Um, and it's very simply, it's like a Brita filter in a way, or if you want to keep it, you know, and so how, how much blood are your kidneys able to clean each minute? How efficiently do they work? So a higher GFR in general um, is, is a good a sign of kidney health, um, whereas a very low GFR can be, you know, is a sign of kidney disease um, and kidney damage. Uh, a normal GFR, um, and it ranges, um, and there's a lot of, you know, and there's, um, it, it can be ver somewhat variable, but it's, let's say, somewhere in the 90 to 120 range. Um, you know, we typically don't diagnose people with kidney disease until it's less than 60. Um, and just to give a sense of the severity, once you get down to under 10, um, is when your your kidneys are no longer no longer able to sustain your body's health, and that's kind of the time period when dialysis or kidney transplantation often occurs. So in that kind of in the, when the GFR gets down to less than ten, um, we see many people who have GFR values in the thirty to sixty range. That's kind of a mild to moderate stage of kidney disease, um, and you know and and we and in terms of the these SGLT2 inhibitors these medications um, that um, were initially you know and I'll kind of note that they were initially started as, as diabetes medicines but we actually have uh, begun using them 
for people with kidney disease, but without diabetes as well, because there's beneficial effects there as well, which is really fascinating. But, um, but the early trials suggested that if your GFR level is below 45, at that point, you should no longer start using them. And that's, and partly that was just, that was the data that we had. That's all we knew. We knew that above 45, it was safe and effective and less than 45, we just didn't know. So we weren't using them. Later trials pushed that down to 30. And then we found that it was really effective and really safe. Latest trials now push it down to 25 and we continue to find that it's really effective and really safe. And there's a trial that also recently came out that pushed it down to 20 and also found that it's particularly effective and particularly safe. So we just keep going lower and lower. Um, and so at this point, we're basically, you know, we're very comfortable um, starting it. Um, I, I will start it as low as 20. I won't go below that just because we don't have any data. Um, and the recommendations from the kidney disease or um, society guidelines is to continue it until you start on dialysis or you know, until that point when you have really, you know, really kidney failure. Um, and the studies now that have come out that followed people um, who got started on this medication and followed them as you know, their kidney function did decline, found that it, can it maintains safety and it maintains efficacy and effectiveness, mm -hmm. even with low, low levels of kidney function. Um, and so it's certainly something that we wanna get people on um, and we, uh, we feel that it's safe and effective um, in low, even with low kidney function. And in fact, it, it, you know, even if people see their kidney function declining while on that medicine, doesn't mean that the medicine is not effective um, because your kidney function could have declined even faster without it. And it's very common that we see actually see that kidney function does decline over time, um, but we but this can delay the progression and slow the progression of kidney disease. And so that's where we're particularly excited about this medication. Right. And I just want to point out that the same concept that in heart failure, you don't have to have diabetes in order to get these medications anymore because they've they started the trials, like you said, looking at patients with diabetes and said, oh, wow, look at this heart failure reduction, kidney protection, you know, all these different beneficial effects. And now they are being used solely. So if you are a heart failure patient, you should be talking to your doctor. Do I qualify? These actually do reduce uh, cardiovascular uh, events in patients. So very important. Absolutely. And then maybe Dr. Preswala, you could talk to us a little bit about uh, the GLP-1 agonists. These are the very familiar names that you all will know, Trulicity, Victoza, and Ozempic. Yes. They're used to be only injectables, but excitingly, there is a oral option, Ribelsis, which maybe yes. you all have heard mm -hmm. of. Um, uh, and actually, there's a lot of benefit as far as weight loss for these drugs. So uh, I have heard of even a new one called Sexenda that is just for weight loss, patients don't have to have diabetes. So I'd love to hear what you think, Dr. Preswala, if you've been using these drugs a lot, what you think about them? Yes, these medications, uh, um, the abbreviation GLP stands for glucagon-like peptide, and it's an agonist because the peptide is made in the body physiologically, and the agonist is basically boosting its, the peptide's effects. So that's why they're called GLP-1 agonists. And uh, what these agents uh, really do is that they, uh, they help insulin secretion from the cells in the pancreas after eating a carbohydrate-rich meal. Um, and uh, that the mechanism also includes improving satiety. So patients feel full uh, and avoid overeating, which helps with weight loss. Um, and um, the medication also reduces glucagon production in the fasting state. And therefore it primarily affects after meal blood glucose control. So it reduces the glucose values during the daytime after eating carbohydrate rich meals, uh, as well as improves patients feeling satisfied what they've eaten and they avoid overeating. And that's the mechanism of them, you know, losing weight by not eating, overeating essentially. Um, the medication uh, is, an, uh, is primarily injectable with the exception of ribelsis. Uh, Ozempic and ribelsis have the same generic formulation. They're semaglutide. Um, and the medication, some of them are once a week. Actually, most of them are once a week, with the exception of Victoza. Victoza is once a day. Um, and uh, the medication helps with weight loss, as well as um, it will help with glucose control. And uh, 
patient preference really determines, um, you know, the use of these medications. Sometimes patients uh, prefer taking an oral medication. And if, if that is the case, then ribelsis would be appropriate. Sometimes patients are like, well, if I have to only take it once a week and it's an injection, well, I, I guess I'll take an injection once a week and I don't have to take something daily. And, you know, as long as uh, we explain that difference and the patient seems motivated, really determines which, uh, which agent from this category we end up using. And these medications, especially um, um, Victoza, as well as um, Ozempic, as well as Trulicity, they have shown cardiovascular benefit as well uh, in reducing, um, you know, events for like heart attack, for example, or uh, hospitalizations for cardiovascular uh, conditions. So it also has that protective effect um, in patients. And so, you know, that is something that we consider, keep in mind when we are prescribing these agents. Sixenda is also, is a formulation of Victoza, sort of. It's a higher dose. Uh, and it helps significantly with weight loss because it significantly helps that satiety feeling satisfied. Um, although when, you know, when they're given in high dose, the more common complaint is nausea or acid reflux type symptoms. Um, but a lot of patients, you know, will uh, still work with that and continue to take it because they love the effects on their sugars and their weight. <laughs> Right, right. Absolutely. And Agnes, I'd love your opinion. So you have experience, I know, with insulin, with SGLT2 inhibitor and with GLP-1. And I think that there can be a lot of fear on some patients' part for injection. So I'd love to hear what you think about that, having experience with the pen injector as well as the insulin, but also just your overall experience with the meds, any challenges you had, benefits, things like that. Um, I didn't really have any challenges with them because I'm my body seems to be fairly tolerant. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Trilicity works really well. I saw major changes in my sugar when I first started it. I am also on, <clears throat> excuse me, Jordiance. Jordiance was the one that when I started taking it along with the Trilicity, I lost 20 pounds in about six months time. And that was not with um any effort really but as you had said doctor um that what i call diabetic hunger that getting up from the table and 20 minutes later you're ready to have more food um that feeling went away and so the ability to eat sensible meals not snack not get the sugar cravings at night um was really effectively squash that and and the weight came off then came covid and the weight came back on but that's <laughs> another story entirely <laughs> um i did not find i'm not needle phobic so i had no problems with injectables i also take insulin i have no problems with it um the the pen for the trulicity Mm -hmm. It's a little more painful than a, an insulin shot because it's a little deeper. Um, but once you know what to expect, it's, it's no big deal. And I would like to add that Trulicity is most user-friendly from amongst all the other GLP-1 agonists. It also, it's very easy. You don't have to sit there and shake it for, you know, like unlike some of the other uh, GLP-1 agonists, we had Bidurion where it needed a lot of mixing and you had mm -hmm. to wait like a few minutes before you can inject it. Trulicity is just a few clicks. Um, and then you, sometimes you don't even see the needle because no, it's, in, it's inside the device. So you mm -hmm. actually, if people with needle phobia, they actually don't see the needle getting into their skin. So it helps. That's a very good point. You know, we kind of like to use an EpiPen as an example. I feel like that's something that a lot of patients have seen if they're not familiar with that pen injector. And of course we can show them, help them to feel confident. Usually once a patient has done one injection, they're a pro. So um, I do have a question from the audience that I'd love to pose. Uh, the, the question is if the patient is on insulin uh, or oral hypoglycemics, perhaps some of the older one, let's say, you know, Genuvia, for example, uh, how do we transition them to some of these newer medications? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. So it depends on their glucose control to begin with, depending on their A1C, if that is accurate. 
And also depending on their finger stick values, if um, you know that patient is motivated and doing it uh, very frequently, for us endocrinologists to determine whether it will be an add-on. Um, usually we don't add a GLP-1 to a Genuvia type, which is called a DPP-4 because of the side effect profile, which adds up together. Um, but uh, let's say if they were on something else, for example, metformin or glimepiride, which is amaryl, and then depending on their glucose control, it would be uh, decided whether it would be an add-on agent or even insulin, for example, if it would be an add-on agent, whether it's a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2, or would it be in lieu of it, um, or would it be, be something that we have to back off insulin dose and then add that on? Uh, so it really depends on their baseline glucose control to decide whether it's added on, whether it's you know substituted, or whether it's added on with uh, backing off certain insulin doses or other medication. Yeah, I, I do want to point out that um, this is a great question. And the person who wrote the question asked about hypoglycemia, hypoglycemics, mm -hmm. other meds and stuff. Um, and that's actually a very important point that metformin, um, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 agonists do not tend to cause hypoglycemia. So they should not on their own, that is, if they're being used um, without other agents. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the old, some of the older agents, including insulin, although it's very effective and you need to use it in a lot of patients, some people need insulin, um, including um, sulfonylureas, uh, you know, they're, if you have not eaten enough food when you take your medicine, you may drop your sugars. And to be honest with my patients, I find, you know, it's, it's almost like a up and down, you know, my sugars were too low. So then I ate, I had some juice and then my, you know, then I took too much insulin then I went back to, you know, it's not, you don't really achieve like a good balance. And then the other aspect of it is um, what other effects do the medications have? Do they actually induce weight gain as opposed to weight loss, uh, which can be a negative effect on uh, heart health and a lot of the other things that we're trying to accomplish. Um, so really thinking about each medicine that you might be considering and saying, does this uh, medicine have negative effects, beneficial effects, neutral effects? How effective are they for lowering my sugars and all those things? And really ask your doctor about all the different options. And just going back to that same question, I would also like to add that if the patient is already in good diabetes control on their current regimen, whether it's insulin or sulfonylurea, for example, and I am considering one of these newer agents, GLP-1 or SGLT-2, I will... Uh, preemptively uh, reduce their insulin doses. And I will preemptively either reduce their sulfonylurea dose or uh, completely stop it, depending on their motivation, their diet, their exercise, and their routine, so to speak. Absolutely. Excellent. And I know that we're focusing a lot uh, uh, on type 2 diabetes tonight. We do actually have a question from a type 1 diabetic asking, and this is a medicine that I'm actually not that familiar with, can use uh, an inhaler insulin called a Frieza? So yes. Okay. Yeah. So the, if there is inhaled uh, insulin that is approved for patients. Usually they have to go through a pulmonary, uh, a pulmonary doctor to get pulmonary function test to make sure that they are able to get this insulin. Um, we, I personally prefer to use an injectable insulin for type one diabetes, because if there's a problem with absorption due to inhaled insulin, and they do not get their long acting regimen uh, because of the absorption issue, they can go into something called diabetic ketoacidosis. So I don't prefer a Frieza as my primary source for long acting insulin, for example, in type one diabetes, but it can be used as a short acting component as long as it's getting absorbed well. And that patient needs to collaborate really well with the endocrinologist or the support staff in the endocrinology office uh, to inform us that, his, uh, uh, that the sugar numbers are staying in good control with the inhaled insulin. Amazing. Thank you. See, you learn something new every day uh, with diabetes management. And um, Dr. Hirsch, I'd love to ask you, we get a lot of questions from our patients with concern over other medications that might be toxic to their kidneys um, as far as dosing considerations, whether it's um, prescription medicines or specifically over-the-counter medicines too that people maybe need to be more careful with in regard to kidney function. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question. Um, so I think um, there's two considerations when it comes to medicines and kidney disease. Um, one is, are the medications themselves harmful to the kidneys? Um, the other question to think about is, um, as the if you have um, kidney disease and your kidney function is reduced, 
will that medicine build up in the body and cause toxicity or harm elsewhere. Whereas if your kidney function was normal, it would it leave your body. And actually a very good example is things like insulin and, and some of these um, diabetes medicines because people who have more advanced kidney disease, they don't get rid of those medicines out of their body. They don't leave the body as quickly. And actually low glucose events or hypoglycemic events can occur more frequently with advanced kidney disease. So oftentimes we need to adjust the diabetes medicines with, when people develop um, worsening kidney functions. That's like just one very poignant example. Um, one thing I always tell um, a lot of the patients that I see is um, I know that you go to the you go to the, the pharmacy and you know they have all these vitamins and herbals and supplements and over the counter stuff, um, painkillers and 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 as a general rule, they're they've made it to the over the counter status because they are very safe. But um, when if you have kidney problems or kidney disease, you have to be much more careful. Um, and you know, and I'm always encouraged. You know, if you have any questions, if you want to try something new, um, you know, I don't know all the herbals or all the supplements. Um, but if you want to try something new, um, just give me a call. Let me know. Um, you know, let's look it up. We, you know, we can try to figure out if it's if it's you know one thing I want to make sure is that it's not going to be harmful. And a lot of things. Um, a lot of medicines that um, seem benign, especially, you know, vitamins are always sold as like this very natural thing, but there are a lot of natural things that are toxic. Um, and so you have to be very careful. And I think um, the most common thing that we talk about for in terms of over-the-counter um, are the over-the-counter painkillers, um, the class of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs. So that includes ibuprofen and Aleve, um, and, which is naproxen and um, uh, Advil and Motrin. Um, those drugs, um, you know, they're, they're generally very safe. Um, obviously they can cause, you know, when used extensively or in the right, in certain people who, in people who have uh, kidney problems or heart problems, they can cause, you know, heart problems and kidney problems and um, stomach ulcers. So they, they, they're not benign by any means. Um, for the most part, um, they are safe when used intermittently or only occasionally, unless you have very advanced kidney disease. But even with mild or moderate kidney problems, like everyone, everyone gets a headache or you know, a knee pain sometimes, and you know, a day or two of Advil is going to be fine for the most part, unless you're again, unless your kidney disease is, is very advanced. Um, and when it comes to, to, to um, prescription medications, I always just tell I tell all my patients I say, if someone if you're going to a doctor or if you wind up in the hospital and they're prescribing something for you, um, just advocate for yourself. Like Agnes was saying, you know, really advocate. Say like, hey, doc, I have kidney problems. Is this safe for my kidneys? This is you know because a lot of you know times doctors you know going through the, the you know may not think about it, may not be top of mind, um, and and the medication may, may be perfectly appropriate or maybe it needs a dose reduction because the kidney function's a little bit reduced, um, and so we kind of have you should just you know be on the lookout for that. Always notify your doctors whenever they prescribe something. Say, hey, doc, I've got kidney problems. Um, you know, what do I do? What do I have to, you know, what do I have to think about when it comes to this medicine? Um, and the last thing I'll just say is that, um, this is very tricky, um, is that some medicines can make it look like the, like they're har harming the kidneys, but they're actually not. And the SGLT2 inhibitors like the Jardians and Invokana, um, you know, that, that's one really good example. And some blood pressure medicines, medications are another good example where that GFR number that I mentioned earlier, uh, it may drop with the initiation of that medicine. And so a lot of patients get very nervous. They say, you know, it's, it looks like it's harming my kidneys. Um, we actually often expect to see that. Um, and the best way I can describe it is that, you know, we're, we're on a marathon, right? We're not on a sprint. And so what these medicines are doing, they're telling you stop sprinting, telling your kidneys to slow down just a little bit because we need to get you 30, we need to get you 30 years or 40 years or whatever. You know, I, I tell patients, how, tell me how long you want to live. I'm going to try to get your kidneys to live that long, you know? And, <laughs> and the goal is to get you to be, be that long. So we're kind of putting a little bit of that kidney into hibernation and slowing your speed down a little bit and putting some into reserve. And so you, we do expect often to see a slight drop in the GFR and that's okay, provided it doesn't go keep going down, obviously. Um, but that's often, you know, and that's just, a, you know, slight subtle change and, and a hibernation of from some medications and the long term safety and efficacy of these SGLT2 inhibitors and other medicines are they're very effective and they're really good for the kidneys, despite that drop. And in fact, that drop is expected. It's such good advice. Thank you so much. And Agnes, I'd love to come to you now. So of course, we talked a lot about, about kidney health. And as our patients with diabetes know, they need to be very careful with their kidneys. But there are a lot of other organ systems that are affected by having diabetes. And so I would love to hear some of the tips, tricks, advice you've gotten along the way. There's a little more maintenance involved than say maybe just your general you know, screening test that we have to get for the average public. So Diabetes can be systemic. 
And I think a lot of people think, oh, it's going to impact my kidneys, it's going to impact my blood. But whether it comes to neuropathy, whether it comes to dry skin, um, there are all sorts of things that you might notice that change in the body. Um, I think part of really tolerating diabetes, if you can call it that, um, is not to dislike yourself because of it. And I think that's a real big key. And having seen changes over the last 25 years, um, that's probably one of the things that strike me most about don't beat yourself up. Don't say things in your own head that you wouldn't say to somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, your sugars are up, what are you going to do about it? Beating yourself up and saying, oh, I'm so stupid. I ate whatever. Or uh, how can I have let myself dot, dot, dot. Um, that's probably the least productive thing you can do. If you find your diabetes is getting to you and you're, you're getting this kind of feeling of blaming yourself, that's where you need to have a conversation with your doctor as well and say, listen, maybe when we talk, we don't emphasize how bad things are. Mm -hmm. uh, but we emphasize what the journey's been and where I've come. Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of times that helps people not feel like they're failing. Um, you know, you read any articles and I lost 65 pounds when I was first diagnosed, but every article I read was obesity causes diabetes if you're obese, you're going to get diabetes, you know, and, and there's a lot of mental positioning that that does, but I knew it wasn't entirely me because my mother, my grandmother all had diabetes and none of the, my mother was 108 pounds. <laughs> And this was not a fat person. Um, but I think those are the kinds of things we've been so conditioned to blame ourselves for any failures that as soon as something doesn't go well, and we know our life is at stake in effect with it, um, we beat ourselves up even more. And I think that that becomes a real vicious cycle. And that's also where people stop testing their blood. They stop really watching what they eat because there's that, that's what I call the, the diabetic burnout that happens sometimes. Um, Absolutely. No, thank really you. It, yes. No, that was a wonderful, wonderful answer. And, and we do have a question about what is the ideal number for glucose control of type two diabetes? And actually Dr. Janos, I'd love it if you weighed in on this too, but also other numbers that we kind of keep in mind, you know, we, we want to really control risk factors in, in more ways than, than one. So I'd love to hear your, your opinion on that. Sure. The, um, the one thing I guess I said in the beginning and talk about, we haven't defined that there is prediabetes and diabetes, right? And I do think that uh, the HbA1c, hemoglobin A1c number is very important. Um, it is a better reflection of your glucose control than just that one-time glucose number that you may get when you happen to be in the office or you check it. Um, you know, if you check your, your sugar when you're fasting and there's not a lot of stuff in your system, it may be normal, but every time you eat, it's quite high. And then if you take the average of all those numbers, it's actually a higher number than you think. So pre-diabetes is essentially um, a hemoglobin of greater than 5.6 um, up until 6.4 and then 6.5 and greater becomes diabetes. Um, so those are just definitions into where you fall. And the only important point there I want to mention is that many people think that pre-diabetes is it's really okay and it's not a, it's not a disease state, but it's actually, again, associated with heart disease, potentially kidney disease down the line. Um, you can still get retinopathy in the eyes. So it's not to be viewed as um, Agnes says, 
as something negative and that we should blame ourselves and it's a terrible thing. It's just a sign, hey, maybe I should work on this a little bit with my lifestyle, with my doc, with maybe, you know, how do I get this better? I just think that it's not, you know, something that we should just say, you know, if I have prediabetes, not a big deal. And if I don't develop diabetes, I'll be fine. Um, that's one. Um, and then um, in terms of uh, diabetes, um, the, where you want to get that number, <clears throat> and this I would definitely love to hear Dr. Priswala's uh, thoughts on, you know, a lot of the research that's been done has stated that once you become a diabetic um, and you're already in that 6.5 range and stuff, then the goal for your sugar marker should be less than seven. Um, and so, um, and that's basically because when they looked at back in the trials, the patients who had, you know, less than seven or greater than seven didn't, um, at that marker is where they saw a benefit and stuff, and, but not necessarily from getting them to 6.5 or 6.2 or six. I have to be honest, I think, and again, this is just my um, personal belief. And again, this is not data based that as we use more of these other medications and that have evidence based and whatnot, I do think we're going to see that if you get your sugars lower, you do better. I mean, I, I do believe that how you get there with your sugars is going to dictate your outcomes and things like that. But at least per the guidelines, and even for some, they may even say less than eight. Um, but I'll, I'll let Dr. Priswala um, give us her thoughts on that. Thank you, Dr. Gianos. So that's a very great point. There are different societies. So the Endocrine Society, there's the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology Society, a European uh, Diabetes Society, and there are different societies that guide us as physicians to aim for a specific target of hemoglobin A1C, whether that is less than 7% or less than 6.5%. It really is based on clinical trials and what they have targeted in those trials to help guide us understand which target may be beneficial for cardiovascular um, disease outcomes, as well as microvascular conditions, such as kidney uh, problems, as well as um, neuropathy or gastroparesis, for example. Um, and in general, an A1C, a hemoglobin A1C of less than 7% has that beneficial component to avoid organ damage, whether it's microvascular disease or macrovascular disease. Um, and so our goal is usually to target an A1C of less than 7%. And in terms of finger sticks, I tell my patients that as a goal, it might be beneficial to target for sugar numbers between 80 and 130 or 80 and 140, depending on the time of the day, preferably throughout the day, they should be checking not just fasting blood sugars, like you mentioned, to help guide and help patients understand that even though they're not doing an A1C at home, as long as they're seeing their blood sugar, you know, their finger stick numbers, but we in 80 and 140, they're in, you know, in good control for their diabetes, um, as long as it's a ver varied blood sugar check throughout the day. So that helps. And, you know, uh, going back to what Agnes mentioned about the burnout, every little difference in hemoglobin A1C, I congratulate my patient because A1C coming down from 14 to 11 or 11 to nine or nine to seven is the patient's hard work. And that motivates them when you congratulate them for doing that hard work for their own health. Obviously we are there as champions and as guidance uh, providers, but at the end of the day, they are, they, patients are living with this every single day. Um, it provokes uh, anxiety, it's overwhelming. Um, it, uh, you know, it can cause lead to depression. Um, and it's important for patients you know, to get that encouragement from providers saying that no matter what, they are still doing a good job. They're doing their best and we're there to help them. And that motivates people to take control of their diabetes. Right. And anybody who's watching, uh, you know, everyone gets a little bit of slack for the whole, yes. for the whole COVID era too, you know, absolutely it's not just in the diabetes world. We know, we understand that it's been challenging but you know, absolutely, we get there. <laughs> and also to mention, sometimes the A1C, the hemoglobin A1C target can be a little different. Sometimes it can be 7.5% or 8% for that, perhaps that elderly patient who cannot necessarily see their insulin pen tip to inject it, or for that elderly patient who is having more hypoglycemia episodes, or, um, you know, even um, patient in any age group having hypoglycemia, it's more dangerous to have low sugars 
um, at that point, at one point in time where your heart has to work harder, it has to pump harder, um, you know, it causes neurological problems, memory issues, and we, to try to avoid low sugar, sometimes we do adjust their hemoglobin A1C target um, until they're, you know, showing more uh, stable numbers, and then we can go back to lowering their A1C in a safer manner. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Preswell, to ask you another question, but we do have a question from the audience uh, asking, I know we've been talking a lot about all these newer medications, but the question is, are there any newer fast acting insulins on the market? I've been taking Novolog for 15 years now. So yes, is there any, <laughs> anything new? In, in yes, the absolutely. So there are several new insulins in the market. Uh, Fiasp is one of the fast acting insulins, as well as Lumgev is one of the fast acting insulins insulins, they act at, at a much faster profile than something like Humalog or Novolog. And, uh, and patients who are insulin sensitive where you know, their, their body accepts the insulin really quickly, it may not be appropriate because then they may be more at risk for low sugars with these fast acting uh, uh, insulins, as opposed to patients who have significant insulin resistance where their body's not accepting insulin. Fast acting insulin may be appropriate. So that's a discussion to have with your endocrinologist. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This has been fantastic. Uh, I think we got to all of the audience questions. Dr. Janice, is there anything else that, that we should highlight uh, that we didn't get to this evening that you want to mention? I think there, these were so many good points that everyone brought up. Uh, most of all, you know, lifestyle is still first. Um, recognizing that this is something that you can work towards improving and improving your quality of life as a uh, Dr. Hirsch pointed out, I think that's what we're working with you um, as uh, clinicians to improve your quality of life currently and for the foreseeable future. Um, there are newer agents out there. You should learn about them. They have multiple different benefits. Um, so really just discussing with your uh, clinician to learn more about it and always advocate for yourself as, as Agnes has mentioned. And I want to just thank uh, Rachel because she's uh, you know, been moderating a lot of our sessions for uh, Building Bridges and a speaker as well. And uh, she's also very knowledgeable in this field. She has taken it upon herself in the last year as a, our nurse practitioner in the preventive cardiology space to master this entire class of drugs. So it's been really useful to all of us as well. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, well, and I do want to remind everyone again that uh, our upcoming talk for next month uh, is going to be another Tuesday evening, April 20th at 7 p.m. We will have Dr. Roshini Milani speaking about disparities and diversity in heart disease. And the following month in May, we're actually going to uh, have an expert panelist Spanish speaking. So please do keep these things in mind for the upcoming talks. As promised, they will all be recorded. So if you can't make it, we understand. Go to the YouTube channel, Doc heart health, uh, which has been put in the, the chat here for uh, everyone to see. And we go back, I believe, to September. So there's lots of good talks about diet, exercise, mindfulness, uh, all of those types of things that, that can really help with overall health. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate you spending your evening with us. It's been such a pleasure. In, informative as always. Again, always something to learn. And, and please do everyone uh, that's attending, please don't hesitate to reach out to your providers about some of these new exciting things that you've learned about. Sometimes all it takes is bringing it up. You know, start the conversation. They're there for you. They're there to help. Uh, and if they aren't, maybe you find another provider. So <laughs> thank you all so much. We thank really you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All thank right. you, Rachel. My Thanks pleasure. for joining us, everybody. Thank you. Take Good care. Night. Take care. Bye-bye.